All righty. Well, hello, everyone. I see they've got an old lady staircase up to the, uh, to the podium. I love it. Uh, usually, they give you those rickety things, and my knees are not up to that, so I get to hold on. It's just awesome. So other than thanking Joe and everyone else for inviting me, I thank uh, the Encore for the nice uh, staircase. So. So I've been asked, the topic I was given was rational integration of acne therapy. I've been called a lot of things in my life, but rational is not one of them. So I'm going to have to sort of stumble along here trying to figure out uh, what exactly is rational when it comes to acne therapy. These are my disclosures that are relevant to today's talk. So I thought about what the word rational must mean in this setting. And I thought it might mean three things, or maybe all of these three things. The first is keeping your knowledge of acne pathophysiology in mind when you devise your treatment plan for the patient sitting in front of you. We know that combination therapy is almost always indicated. Sometimes you're picking two drugs with similar mechanism of action so that they target one specific aspect of acne particularly well synergistically. Or sometimes you're picking one from column A and one from column B so that you're attacking the problem from two different directions. Whichever you're doing, you're, it's unlikely that you're using one medication. I don't remember who told me this or where the stat came from, but apparently we write on average 2.53 prescriptions for every acne patient who walks through the door. So apparently that message of combination therapy is getting out. I think another rational thought is, it didn't come to me right away, and I was never, this was never explained to me this way, so it's taken me a while to realize that there's a difference between acute therapy for acne, when the patient walks in with a horrible face full of acne, and then chronic therapy, the maintenance period of time, and the two may look completely different. In fact, hopefully they do, because I think they should. I think we need to be devising an exit strategy, if you will, the second the patient is in the office. When you're writing, when you're putting pen to paper for that very first visit, and you might be writing for oral antibiotics or such, you need to have a way to get out of the jam that you got yourself into because those antibiotics are going to have to be discontinued, and the patient doesn't always want that to happen because they get kind of psychologically addicted to the stuff. Which leads to the last rational thought I'll have this morning, which is always keeping antibiotic resistance in mind when you're taking care of these patients, because acne is a chronic disease chronic relapsing course over many years, maybe the entire adult life of an adult female, with severe psychological overlay that we cannot forget when taking care of our patients. And this acute and maintenance therapy is the crucial issue, because the maintenance therapy is what leads to the most of the frustration, right? I mean, our patients can tolerate a month, two months, three months of a drug that's associated with side effects, but they're never going to tolerate that for their entire adult life. Right? nor should they have to. So we've got a very difficult balance of efficacy, tolerability, but also acceptability thrown in, right? You can't expect them to use something that makes them look or feel greasy, look or feel irritated for 20 years. So it's an entirely different ballgame when you're dealing with maintenance. And it adds urgency to the bacterial resistance rational thought that I had before, because uh, we're not going to be using antibiotics, hopefully, in that maintenance phase. So if I may be so bold as to paraphrase and summarize uh, a talk or two by Jim Del Rosso, which is hard to do, I think what he said this morning was that acne is an inflammatory disorder we're beginning to realize, not so much an infectious disorder. And that although P. acnes is clearly part of the pathophysiology, it's not really an infection per se. All adults have P. acnes in their follicles, but not all of us have acne. And the number of the little critters having, that are jammed into our follicle seems to have nothing to do with the severity of our acne. So it's probably, as he was just describing, the downhill pro-inflammatory effects that P. acnes sets up rather than an infection. And overuse and abuse of antibiotics we know have created what the CDC director calls one of the most pressing public health concerns of our time. Added to that is the fact that P. acnes cannot be eradicated. It lives there, right? You can suppress it, but you can't eradicate it. So if you can't eradicate it, antibiotics used as antibiotics are destined to failure. 
So why are we even using them, right? The CDC is suggesting, as Jim I'm sure said before, I was a little bit late, I apologize, that, we, that part of antibiotic stewardship is to get the right dose of the right antibiotic at the right time for the right duration. I would add to that, which I think is a lovely thought, I would add to that for something that was infectious to begin with, right? And if acne isn't an infection, what the heck are we doing with putzing around with the, with the antibiotics? Which has led Ted Rosen to say, why don't we not use antibiotics at all in acne? Clearly a controversial proposal. Um, and you know he likes to stir up the pot. I'm sure he uses antibiotics here and there. Um, but it's an interesting proposal and one that might actually be possible. And the lay press has caught on to it. The Huffington Post has begged us not to be using antibiotics anymore for acne. What would they do if they knew what we did for rosacea, right? They'd be even more astounded. Or that we use doxycycline sometimes in the treatment of bullous pemphigoid. Thank goodness they don't know about that. Let's keep it quiet, okay? I don't want to see what they'd have to say. Now, we're not the only bad guys here. Part of the bad guys is the agricultural industry. We know that cows are fed antibiotics and fed hormones, so then we end up eating a hormone and antibiotic hamburger at McDonald's, and it's absolutely been demonstrated that this can lead to, directly, to illness and perhaps even death. Add to this, I was trying this morning to download a picture of cow poop, but I couldn't find one that I liked. But add to this that they also take the cow poop from those cows who just ate the antibiotics and hormones and turn it into fertilizer that again gets sprinkled all over your organic vegetables, right, that you eat. Not so much organic anymore because the soil has estrogens in it and has antibiotics in it. So you really can't get away from that. Frankly, I think they're part, much more of the problem than we are, but all we can control is what we can control, which is what we write for. So keeping antimicrobial resistance in mind, what is a rational integrative therapy for acne? So I think our central dogmas are that we're going to limit our exposure to antibiotics, maybe considering anti-inflammatory dose doxycycline instead of full dose antibiotic, utilizing topical retinoids always and early, adding benzoyl peroxide always when there's an antibiotic either topical or oral prescribed, both to treat acne and to prevent the development of resistance. Think about topical dapsone, perhaps. Hormonal therapy, if indicated, meaning most women, because guys sort of don't like it when you treat them with hormones. It's so silly. Um, and then switching maybe to isotretinoin earlier and more regularly. So the clinical approach that I utilize when I see my acne patients takes really a matter of seconds originally. How long does it take you when you walk into the room to decide, all other things being equal, how you would treat the patient sitting in front of you? If pie in the sky, you know, no insurance companies, no problems with managed care and all that kind of stuff. Seconds, right? Absolutely seconds. Everything else is figuring out the other baggage that the patient brought to the visit with them. So we're thinking of, we're looking, is the, are the lesions inflammatory? Are they non-inflammatory? Is there a combination of the two? Is it on the face, the chest, the back, the arms, or just the face? Is it mild, moderate, or severe? Is there scarring, either emotional or physical? Does the patient even want to be treated? Meaning here that teenage boy that got dragged in kicking and screaming by his mother. And you say, so what can I do for you today, my opening line? And he says, ask her, right? That kid, does he even want to be treated? Because frankly, if his acne is really mild and he's not scarring and he's going to school and getting A's and participating in sports, why treat him? All it's going to do is add problems to his relationship with his mom, who's going to be on his back every night. Did you use your medicine, right? She's going to create problems. And also the ability of the patient to tolerate side effects. Not are the medications that we're giving them tolerable. Are they tolerable to something that might be intolerant, right? So there's two levels of tolerability. And Bearing in mind that the goals of treatment are to resolve the existing lesions, which is going to take a while, patients think it's going to happen right away, to suppress new lesions. I always tell my patients, you're using your medications today for next month, right? It's not going to get rid of the zits that you have now. And that successful treatment includes not only using the right medications, but ensuring adherence, which is a whole other topic for another day. So let's start looking at our topical retinoids. 
And my point that I'd like to make about topical retinoids is that they're essential in all stages and in all patients with acne at all times. Right? Every single one of my acne patients is on a topical retinoid of some sort. Now, this picture happens to be from the tazeratine phase three trial, but I could show you the same picture with the uh, tretinoin trials and with the adapalene trials. Retinoids alone, as standalone therapy, do an awesome job, not just with non-inflammatory acne, or as Jim would yell at me for saying that, um, the, the lesions that were formerly referred to as non-inflammatory. Uh, but they also do a bang-up job on inflammatory lesions. How many of you would have used an oral antibiotic at baseline in this patient? Really? Honestly? Nobody? You're just not voting. Oh, there, there it goes, some hands. But certainly, you would have been using topical antibiotic, or at least a combination of antimicrobials, right? Along with your topical retinoid. You wouldn't just throw in a topical retinoid at this patient. But yet, this is how well they do at week 12. Now, the patients aren't going to wait 12 weeks to get this much better, but just bear in mind that the retinoids are such good anti-inflammatory drugs that they do a, a very good job in and of themselves as monotherapy if the patient has the, uh, the, the gumption to wait that long. So we're using our topical retinoids to prevent the precursor lesions, to treat the comedones that they have, to decrease the inflammatory lesions in combination or as standalone, and certainly very crucial for the maintenance phase of therapy, but you have to start early. We have a bunch of studies that show us the necessity of starting early. We have minocycline with cesaretine, doxycycline with, dox with adapalene, and as Jim just showed you, we have doxycycline with adapalene benzoyl peroxide combination, all of which showed using from the get-go the retinoid, then you can stop the antibiotic at three months and expect maintenance to occur without return of the lesions. If you think that you're going to use oral antibiotics and the patient's going to come back at three months and you're going to say, OK, that's it, no more antibiotics, here is a prescription for your topical medication, that's not going to fly. It has to be started right at the very beginning. Topical retinoids in combination with uh, antimicrobials, this is just one example of many in the literature, uh, work better than either agent alone. So here it happens to be benzoyl peroxide 6% cleanser and uh, tretinoin 0.1 microsphere formulation gel. And you can see in red that the two of them together were much, uh, much more effective than the tretinoin alone in blue. Okay? So combination therapy is the name of the game. So topical antimicrobials. Um, erythromycin and clinda, historically the most commonly used, but resistance is a big issue, especially with uh, erythromycin. Used in combination, uh, benzoyl peroxide and clindamycin, particularly effective. We have several versions of it. And the reason why we're using our benzoyl peroxide is that it exerts greater and more rapid anti p activity than topical antibiotics. Alone, it significantly improves inflammatory, but also <clears throat> comedonal acne. It's not associated at all with antimicrobial resistance, and if you use it along with topical and oral antibiotics, you can mitigate the, uh, the development of antibiotic resistance, at least locally on the face where you're applying the benzoyl peroxide or on the back. And benzoyl peroxide wash was actually shown by Jim Layden to reduce strains uh, resistant strains of piacnus. So even if you created the resistance, you can sort of take it back. I didn't really mean that. Here, have some benzoyl peroxide. Let's get rid of that. Benzoyl peroxide, however, in the combination products is really the workhorse. What we're seeing here in yellow is benzoyl peroxide by itself in this particular study, giving you a nice two-log reduction in p acnes counts. And if you add clindamycin in the red, you see that you do get an improvement, but it's probably the benzoyl peroxide which is the workhorse. So if you're forced by managed care to utilize benzoyl peroxide and uh, clindamycin or erythromycin separately, um, I would suggest that you consider the benzoyl peroxide as a standalone uh, rather than adding an antimicrobial into the, into the fray. Here is the study by Cunliffe that clearly demonstrated to us that clindamycin in yellow by itself at eight weeks, all of a sudden the resistant strains take off like a gunshot, whereas with benzoyl peroxide in the blue line, a nice uh, no development of, uh, of, of resistant strains over time. 
So are all benzoyl peroxides equivalent, though? I mean, we don't want the take-home message to be, OK, so go to the pharmacy and buy Pete's benzoyl peroxide wash, because we really know very little about Pete's products, right? So are all benzoyl peroxides created equal? Probably not. Um, is location important? Probably is, but we basically don't know. We have very, very few studies, especially on the over-the-counter benzoyl peroxides. So are they all equivalent? This study, just to bring home the message, this study took benzoyl peroxide cleanser in blue, 8% creamy wash that we all thought was an excellent uh, benzoyl peroxide product and had been shown to reduce piacus on the face, but they put it on the back as a wash. Turns out it doesn't work on the back. Who knew, right? Never been studied is my point. Whereas the, the, uh, the foams, which were intended to be utilized on the back in 5.3% 5, 5 or in 9.8%, showed a nice reduction in P. acnes. So my point here is not go out and buy the foams. My point is that you don't know until you study it. So you really ought to be making recommendations, in my opinion, for products that have been well studied and looked at very carefully before you assume that the benzoyl peroxide that you're utilizing uh, is the best thing for your patient. Drawbacks for benzoyl peroxide, as we know, concentration-dependent irritation, a little bit of contact allergy, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent, although maybe David Cohen could comment on that. Uh, bleaching of clothing towels and sheets, uh, Sam Whittacom from Allegan uh, loaned me this picture, uh, which Julie Harper has said scares the daylights out of her. It looks like this woman is about to kill you for bleaching her sheets. I love the picture. And of course, the potential for inactivating tretinoin. So is this real? Well, we know that benzoyl peroxide is a potent oxidizer and can degrade oxidize uh, actives with which is co-applied. But we like to co-apply. We would love our patients to be able to use both medicines at one time if they choose to, because it improves compliance. Well, it turns out that adapalene, microsphere, and micronized formulations of tretinoin and tazeratine are all stable in the presence of benzoyl peroxide, but non-microsphere or micronized tretinoin is degraded within two hours. So if you're using the generic, you have to separate your benzoyl peroxide and your tretinoin. We also have this issue of discoloration of topical dapsone. Notice I said discoloration of topical dapsone. It's actually not the face that's turning yellow-orange. It's the dapsone, which has been oxidized in the presence of benzoyl peroxide and can be brushed or, in the worst case scenario, washed off. Much has been made of that for no reason. Azelaic acid uh, is a relatively, it's a little bit weaker than the other drugs we've discussed. It is active against P. acnes, also decreases keratin production, may treat both the PIH and the acne at the same time, and perhaps its most compelling argument for its use is pregnancy category B. Topical dapsone. Um, been around for a long time. Orally has a lot of problems, but topically is highly effective. Anti-inflammatory activities are thought to be its mechanism of action. Although it is an uh, antimicrobial for leprosy and such, it does not seem to kill P. acnes. The topical formulation is considered quite safe. And here we see our reduction in inflammatory lesions at the end of the study, a 48% reduction in inflammatory lesions. Not so good in the d reduction in non-inflammatory lesions with a 32%. So it begs, obviously, a combination therapy, right? Topical dapsone plus a topical retinoid, so that you're coming at the problem from two different directions. And as you can see on the right, along with tazeratine cream 0.1%, a statistically significant increase in the reduction of not just inflammatory, non-inflammatory, but inflammatory lesions as well. For some reason, you've seen this slide before, I'm sure, for some reason, uh, or, uh, topical dapsone seems to work better in girls than it does in boys. And this does not seem to be related to compliance issues. So take that for what it is. Maybe it's because adult women are in this group too, and they, perhaps they have a different kind of acne than younger women do. Very quickly, some oral therapies. I'm not going to spend much time on this. Topical, oral antibiotics, of course both for reducing P. acnes and for decreasing inflammation through numerous different pathways. Uh, and most of this, if we put this slide up next to Jim's pathophysiology slide, you would see that what we think about the pathophysiology of acne now being an inflammatory disorder and the tetracyclines really go hand in hand. 
So how about the use of anti-inflammatory dose doxy? That sounds like a good idea. Let's get rid of the antibiotic and keep the anti-inflammatory. Well, it's not FDA approved for the treatment of acne, but we have 20 BID and we have 40 once a day. Does not kill P. acnes and good anti-inflammatory activity. So what studies do we have? We have one study that looked at 20 BID with a nice reduction in inflammatory lesions. We have another that used it as a step down from full dose doxy and then down once the patients got better to, four, to 20 twice a day. And now we have a phase two trial uh, that looked at doxy 40 versus doxy 100 versus placebo. And as you can see at the end, those top two lines, the doxy 40 and the doxy 100 were neck and neck both highly more effective than the placebo down at the bottom. So that's food for thought that we look forward to. I'm not gonna spend any time on hormonal therapy because Julie Harper's coming up next and she can do a much better job than I. I just wanna point out two things. The last bullet point, it takes several months for spironolactone to reach its potential. The last line in oral contraceptives usually takes three to six months to see full effect. So here is one of the studies with drospirinone containing oral contraceptives, and as you can see, it didn't reach its full potential until cycle five. So what if we used an oral antibiotic from the beginning along with our oral contraceptive or spironolactone? And then at three months, we'd be able to stop our oral antibiotic at the very time that spironolactone or birth control pills would be uh, taking the stage. Now, Billy's going to do isotretinoin tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend time doing that except to remind you that avoidance of many, multiple courses of antibiotics and perhaps going to isotretinoin earlier uh, is what we should be considering because what else do we have for this kid? And this is Jim Layden's famous before and after isotretinoin photograph, all in the hopes of having this not happen. So acne is a chronic disorder for which there are only two cures, time and isotretinoin. And maintenance therapy is going to be necessary for virtually everyone. Antibiotic overuse and abuse have led to critical health care problems. So I want you to consider, should antibiotics be part of acne therapy? Sure. I have patients who can't get better any other way. But should antibiotics be part of maintenance phase of therapy? I think not. And I encourage you to think globally while you're acting locally, taking care of your patients, because it is literally in your hands. Thank you very much.